Welcome back everyone. So you're new to Magic Online. You've signed up for a premium account, you've logged in, and you've landed on a homepage that probably looks something like this. What do you do next? That's what we're going to talk about today. So this video is going to contain a bunch of helpful tips about how to build your deck, how to acquire cards, how to use event tickets, how to use bots, and a bunch of helpful and time-saving tips that I've picked up over the years. Part two of this video will contain a bunch of tricks about how to play faster and how to use hotkeys while you're actually in game. So be sure to check out that video once it goes live. But for this video, I will be posting timestamps in the description below if you want to skip around to different topics. I should also point out that I am a commander player, so I will be taking the commander perspective on a lot of these helpful tips, but that doesn't mean that there aren't helpful tips if you're also here for draft, standard, modern, that sort of stuff. So, but anyway, let's get going. So you've logged in, you've landed on this homepage, what do you do next? So the first thing that I might do is just go into the settings over here in this gear, and there's a bunch of things you can tinker around with uh, in your settings. Right now, I have animate foil treatment off, which uh, there's like a little foil animation that kind of makes them shine. My PC is older, so I have that shut off just so it doesn't use as many resources on my machine. Uh, I've also got the music turned off. Sound effects in Magic Online have historically been terrible. So uh, I keep the music off, and especially because I do content, I just don't want the Magic Online sound effects. And there's some other settings you can mess around with in here. Uh, you've got input settings, so you can change the key bindings if you don't like some of the hotkeys that things are assigned to. Um, the only real one that I've changed, and you guys don't have to do this, but the zoom key, which zooms in on a card when you're in a game, I have it switched to Z. I think it's on Q now. If you guys are more used to like the MOBA setup, Q probably works just fine for you, but uh, I got used to it being Z because it was Z for a long time in Magic Online, so I've changed that one. But I think I've left everything else the same, so you probably don't really need to change anything in there, but if you want to, you can. Uh, so you'll see a bunch of in-duel settings, and you can set stops of when you want priority during your opponent's turn and your turn. And these will change depending on what you're doing and what deck you're playing. And it's important to know that you can change these within the game while you're playing, because there's a few that I'll edit on the fly. One of the big ones is if I'm going to do something on the upkeep, I'll set a stop on my upkeep. Uh, and a lot of times that's like a Vampiric Tutor, Enlightened Tutor kind of thing. But I won't usually leave it checked just because if I'm not casting one of those, I don't usually have a reason to stop during my upkeep other than that just based on the type of stuff that I like to play. But an interesting one is Miracle Bluffing. So if you're playing with a lot of Miracles, you may want to turn that one on. I don't play with a lot of Miracles, so I don't have it on right now. It's not that big of a deal to me. And the Miracle Bluffing just makes it so opponents can't see if you've stopped on your draw and are deciding whether to cast the Miracle or not. It'll hide that information from them, otherwise they can see it. I probably could turn it on, but it just doesn't come up that often for me where it's something that I really need, so... Uh, so if you go to this one called Game History, you can see your history of games. I don't know how far back this goes. I'm sure they have to archive these at some point. Uh, looks like right now they're going back to October of 2019. Obviously, I've been playing Commander much longer than that. So, uh, you know, at some point they archive the games. But you can, uh, if you go into the details, you can watch the replay of the game. We won't do that here just because a lot of times the replays don't always work and they tend to crash things. Uh, but, you know, some amount of the time they do actually work if you want to go back and watch one of the replays from your game. You can do that here. Also, it'll show the record of everything that's going on so you can see your wins, losses, draws, all that sort of stuff. So that's just a few things in the settings. There isn't a ton to do in there. Probably the biggest one is just turning off the sound effects and the music. I don't find their sound effects particularly pleasing, so uh, that's the big one that I've done. Anyway, let's move on from that. Let's talk about getting yourself a deck built. So... Uh, when you signed up for Magic Online, they probably gave you some amount of cards that probably aren't really sufficient to build any kind of reasonable deck. Uh, so we'll go over to the collection right here, and you'll see the collection of cards that you own. There's a couple filters up here at the top we'll talk about real quick. One of the big ones that I use a lot is this quantity filter. Uh, so right now I've got a quantity one or more, basically, which shows only cards that I own. If I want to show all cards, I can slide that to zero. And now we can see every card in the game, basically. Uh, and that's helpful if you're trying to build a deck and you don't have the card yet. So just to give you an example, I'll pull up a deck real quick. Pull up this Adriana deck right here. So we've got ourselves an Adriana deck. There's this card right here, Blade Banish, it's called. Uh, we want to add this to the deck, but we don't yet own one. We can add it in right here. You'll see the little, uh, you'll see the little warning sign around it. It says this card is not yet in your collection, but it's in the deck, and we can use this later on to go buy the cards in the deck. And I'll show you guys an easy way to do that. Uh, that does put us over 100 cards also, so it no longer makes the deck legal. But just for the sake of illustration, so we'll get rid of that. 
But yeah, so a lot of times I will mess with this quantity filter during deck building. If I know I'm trying to add specific cards to the deck that I don't yet own, so that's a helpful tool. Another thing too, this versions button, some interesting stuff in here. You can show versions separately if you want to, and sometimes that'll matter if there's multiple editions of a card. All right, so let's take a card like Path to Exile. Path to Exile has multiple printings on Magic Online. So I own one copy of a Conflux Path of Exile. Uh, but if I wanted to add one of these other ones, I can add it to the deck. And again, we'll get the little warning sign. And it said this version of the card is not in your collection. And you'll see over here, uh, this five color reanimator angel deck, it's got the little green symbol next to it. That means that I don't own the version of one of the cards in the deck. I can still play the deck, but it does give you that little warning sign until you resolve the fact that uh, you don't have one of the versions of the name of the card in the deck. So we'll click on that one real quick just to see what's happening. All right, so I'm missing a Vivid Marsh. Apparently at some point I got rid of my Vivid Marsh, or at least I got rid of that specific Vivid Marsh. So one of the things I can do if I have multiple ones, get rid of that and then add the correct one. And now the little green thing has gone away. And now we have a completely legal deck. So it's one of those things that will just annoy you to death, but doesn't actually stop you from playing the game. Another thing you can do while you're working on decks is you can import decks and export decks. So if you want to import an existing deck list of a deck you already have, go to a deck website like Tapped Out or wherever you keep your deck lists, save that into a text file, and then click on this button down here, and then we just use this import feature, and then we can import that deck list into Magic Online. You'll probably need to set the format, but here we see we've got our deck list imported, and uh, because this was a deck list that I exported from Magic Online, everything is perfectly where it should be. Uh, most of the time, your commander will end up in the 99 somewhere, and then you'll just need to drag it into the command zone, so no big deal right there. Uh, but the other thing you can do also is export your decklist if you want to take your decklist from Magic Online and put it on one of the deck websites like Tapped Out, like Goldfish, uh, wherever. So right click, export, and again, then we just save it as a plain text format. And then we save, and then we go to those websites, and we can import that plain text file that way. So this is something I do daily on the channel because I'm pulling in deck lists a lot. I'm exporting them so that I can post them so that people can see them. And these are some really helpful tools so you don't have to sit there and type out every single card name, which will take you a little while if you're trying to put the deck together. But anyway, let's take a look at how we actually acquire cards now. So the first thing to understand is that the primary currency on Magic Online is event tickets. And these more or less translate from $1 to one ticket in US. Event tickets are the primary currency on Magic Online. You'll use them to sign up for competitive events where you can win prizes back. That could be limited events, that could be constructed events, standard, modern, draft, all that kind of stuff. I don't do so much of that anymore. So for me, I primarily use these just as a way to get cards for the decks I'm building. There are other forms of currency as well. Uh, the big one being play points. These are not tradable where event tickets are tradable. So play points, you earn them for winning events and then you can use play points or tickets to sign up for the event. But the play points you can't really do anything with other than sign up for events. So as far as we're concerned, the main currency will be event tickets, but you will earn play points from playing in certain events and you can also use those to sign up for those events, but you can't purchase cards with play points. So keep that in mind. Now that we see what the currency is, let's go to the store and buy some tickets. So if you click on the store tab right here, you'll see what things you can purchase from the MTGO store. And uh, right here we see event tickets. So let's go ahead and buy 10 tickets. So we click on ticket, we click on the quantity we want. So we add in our payment information, then we hit checkout and you'll get a little checkout confirmation thing right here and we'll purchase. So there we have it, we bought 10 tickets and obviously you can buy whatever number you wanna buy. One thing that you can do, I have used services like mtgotickets.com in the past. This website is not affiliated with Wizards, but if I'm planning to buy a large number of tickets, I have used their service because sometimes they sell them slightly cheaper than they do on Magic Online. And I don't know if this is still true, but when I was buying a lot of tickets, you didn't have to pay sales tax on them, which if you're buying like 500 tickets at a time, it's actually a pretty big deal. So I have used their service in the past. Uh, I have had some issues with their service in the past because my username has a space in it, which I'm pretty sure is a thing they don't allow anymore, but I signed up so long ago, they allowed a space in my name. And that's definitely caused problems with this service right here. And I've had to like get their help team involved. So it's a thing that's there. You can use it if you want to. There is a little more risk involved, but I've always gotten the tickets that I paid for. So, you know, just that I've had to jump through more hoops at the cost of trying to save on the sales tax 
relevant if you're trying to buy large quantities of tickets. Now, if you do actually purchase tickets from this service, uh, you'll go to their bot in the game and grab the tickets from their trade bot. Uh, but another thing you'll see right on this website right here is that the price that they're selling tickets at, right now they're selling it at one, and the price that they're buying tickets at, this will fluctuate over time. These will go up and down. So like a lot of times they might sell tickets at like 0.98 or something like that if the value of tickets dwindles a little bit and uh, 0.85 is actually pretty low on the buy usually it's at least in the nine somewhere uh, like 0.92 is more average but with the virus going on right now prices are definitely a little bit abnormal so anyway that's a couple different ways to acquire tickets now how do we actually get cards we're gonna go to this trade tab right here and you'll see all the posts of people trading many of these are bots in most games, bots are generally considered to be a bad thing. For Magic Online, they're actually a pretty good thing. They do make it much easier to acquire cards than it would be if there were no bots. One of the main things is that you'll want to use reputable bots. The two that I use for almost everything, 90% of my transactions are going to be from the MTGO Traders bots. Almost everything I do is with them. I've done literally thousands of transactions with them and had no problems. The only thing that I don't use them for is like day one when a brand new set releases. They don't always have all the brand new stuff in stock, especially the high demand stuff like mythics and legendaries and things like that. So for that stuff, I will use goat spots because they seem to do a better job of having the brand new stuff in stock. So yeah, these trade bots are the main ways that you will acquire cards. Obviously, this is true of like all facets of magic. Don't try to open packs to build your deck. It's just not a smart move financially. It will cost you tons and tons of money to build a single deck. Don't ever do that. So use the bots, buy singles, and it'll be so much cheaper than trying to crack packs. But yeah, continuing on our example. So we bought 10 tickets. Let's go buy some cards. So I'm going to go to the MTGO Traders bot. I'm going to right click. I'm going to click trade. One thing I forgot to mention is that you do have trade binders on your collection screen and you need to make your cards tradable so that people can see them. So before we go on with this, I'll just show you guys the binders really quick. So we'll hop back to the collection. So we got this bottom tab down here called trade binders. Uh, we can create a new one if we want to. So we'll click on this icon. Uh, we can name the new binder. We'll call this our 10 tickets binder. It has nothing in it when it gets created. So we'll need to add whatever we want to trade to it. So I'll right click on my tickets. I'm going to go add more and then I'll type the number 10. So now we've got 10 tickets for trade in here. I'll put a card in here as well, just so you guys can see how that works. We'll make this Draneth Magistrate for trade. So if I wanted to sell this card back to them, I would use this binder to do that because it's now tradable from this binder. So let's go back to the trade screen, get back into this trade. We'll right click on trade and we'll click on our 10 tickets binder. So the trade window comes up. You can see all the stuff that they have available for trade and you can see the quantity of it. Uh, this top number is the number of that card that you own. That's a good thing to keep in mind. Uh, if you're playing commander, you only ever need one copy of a card. If you're playing standard or modern, you'll need four ofs, but basically you'll never need more than four copies of a card. So the bottom number is the number that they have for trade. The top number is the number that you own currently. So what are we buying? Let's buy some stuff. So I'm gonna purchase a few cards with mutate because why not? So we'll type mutate into the search bar right here. And the search bar is uh, actually does a pretty good job. It'll search the name and it'll search the rules text. It also search the creature type. So it'll search like most of the aspects of the card, which is super helpful. Uh, and we'll, we'll do some filtering here. So uh, we'll go type and I'll make it legendary. So we'll search for all the legendary mutate creatures. I've got a few of them, but we need to buy a few more. So we'll buy a Brakos, we'll buy Nethroi, and we'll buy Vadrock. And we'll see that there's a cost associated with these. So over here, we can see the cost for each card. Uh, we got 2.01 tickets, 2.62 tickets, and Brakos will be 1.8. And what'll happen is you can't trade fractions of tickets. However, the bots will store that fraction of a dollar. So the next time you come back, you'll have a remaining credit. So when we logged into this bot to trade, it said we have 0.79 credits remaining from previous trades. So, so that's an important thing to keep in mind. And that's why I try to use the same bots over and over again. You don't want to spread fractions of dollars across hundreds of bots because you'd be losing value that way. And, you know, you could potentially be getting more cards without having to spend more money just by using your fractions of a dollar. So anyway, we're purchasing these cards. Oh, one more thing I want to show you while we're here. Clear out this real quick. We've got these three cards that we're looking to purchase. Another thing that we can do, and this is really helpful when you're building decks, you can use this search tools button. And now you can select from decks where we don't have the complete set of cards needed for that deck. Uh, one of those little warning icons is showing up. 
So in this case, I don't know, we'll select this Dak and Blackblade deck right here and see what cards we're missing from it. It'll add all of the cards that are missing that the bot has. So we'll select it and then we'll hit select. And apparently I'm missing a choke estuary out of that deck. So that's a really easy way when you build the deck to grab all the cards that you need instead of having to type in the names of every single card that you're trying to pick up that you're missing from the deck. So yeah, that search tools function is super helpful, shows all the decks that don't have all the cards that they need. Uh, there's also a thing called a wish list on the binder page that you can use. That's not something I use that much, but it is there and you can just set up which cards you want in a wish list. Same idea, it'll just pull from those cards with whatever's available on the bot. If something wasn't available, there'll be a little message that says the following cards weren't available. So yeah, we've got some things that we want to buy. We'll submit the trade right here. And uh, we saw the little pop-up of the new cards we just purchased. Unfortunately, I X'd out of it really quickly just because it's like second nature for me to do that. So sorry about that. But anyway, those cards are now in our collection and we can see them if we search for them. There, there's the Brockos, there's the uh, Vadrock, and there's the Nethroi. So another thing with bots is that some people do have free bots where uh, whatever period of time they'll allow you to take so many free cards. These aren't going to be format staples or super desirable cards, but you'll still be able to find some cards that you can use in your deck until you're able to get whatever that best in slot option is. So we'll try going into this free bot right here. This one says four commons or one uncommon free every day. So we see some stuff that they have. They have some guild gates, they have some tap lands, panorama. Those are all very useful commander cards. Uh, what do we got here? We got some split cards, got some deserts, more guild gates. Ooh, Frontier Bivouac. That's a pretty sweet card, right? So I'm looking through here. There's a lot of lands that you can use, a lot of tap lands I'm seeing that are all pretty legit for a commander deck. Uh, right now I'm seeing this card far away. Looks very playable. Can bounce a creature or it can force opponent to sacrifice a creature. So it seems pretty legit to me. Let's grab it. So we've got that right there. And then we just hit submit. So there's our new card that's been added to our collection. And this one's maybe not the best example. Some of the other bots, so like the card hoarder bots right here, says get 64 free cards courtesy of card hoarder. I don't know what the time period is. It might be daily, it might be weekly on that. And yeah, this is just another way for you guys to get more cards into your collection, uh, especially without spending money, which is even better. So yeah. Oh, another thing to keep in mind is MTGO card prices are way different than paper prices. A great way to look those up beforehand is MTG Goldfish. They have really good price data on all of their stuff. And I believe the MTG Goldfish prices for Magic Online pulls from like MTGO traders and one or two other really big bot chains. So it's almost always accurate, but let's just pull up Soul Ring. Soul Ring's an interesting card because it has like a million printings in both paper and online. Uh, if you're looking over here at the Goldfish webpage, you'll see all these blue ones are the paper costs and the paper printings. These orange ones are the online printings. Let's go for the Commander 14 edition of Soul Ring. So right now that's $12 on Magic Online compared to its $4 paper costs. Now this is kind of an oddity. Most cards on Magic Online for Commander are very cheap. Soul Ring has gotten strangely expensive. Uh, especially with the virus and especially with more people checking out Magic Online. You can take the same concepts from what makes a card expensive in paper and apply that to Magic Online, but the times that cards get reprinted on Magic Online are way different than the times that they get reprinted in paper. So that will lead to some pretty wild price discrepancies. Another really interesting one is Lord Wingrace. Lord Wingrace is $5 in paper and is $25 on Magic Online, and a while ago it was even more expensive than that. At one point it was up to 78 tickets, not that long ago, but it's dropped drastically. And the reason for that is that they've introduced more supply into the marketplace. So for a minute, Lord Wingrace was one of the most expensive cards on Magic Online. So yeah, the same concepts of supply and demand apply to Magic Online, but the times that they reprint things are just way different. Uh, and you'll see that this is out of a treasure chest. So you'll see this treasure chest right here. I don't have any currently. Uh, but this is like the loot box mechanic of Magic Online. I don't use these. When you play events, you will get some number of these in addition to play points and other things that they pay out. I would say that it's never really worth opening these. These are a lot like cracking a pack. You buy a $4 pack, your chances of getting $4 back out of that pack are not great. Same concept applies to these treasure chests. I would just trade these to bots for whatever their trade cost is. Uh, I haven't looked at it recently. Usually it's somewhere in the two to three ticket range, but again, I haven't looked at the price because I haven't dealt with these in a while. But generally the same idea as opening a pack. I would much rather take the guaranteed two to three tickets trading this to a bot than I would trying to risk opening literal nothing out of this treasure chest. 
But what's important to keep in mind is that they change the list of cards that are available to populate in these treasure chests. So at some point in April, they decided that Lord Wingrace had way too small of a supply. They made it so Lord Wingrace can populate in treasure chests and or populate more often in treasure chests. And that brought the price back down because now there's more supply entering the marketplace and it's not as rare as it was. So uh, so yeah, these treasure chests are ways that they use to introduce more cards into supply. Soul Ring is a card that apparently needs to uh, make its way back in because those are getting weirdly expensive. Uh, but just to give you guys a quick example on what typical Magic Online prices look like, I've shown kind of the expensive cards just because they came to mind off the top of my head, but... All right, so just to give you guys an example of what prices typically look like on Magic Online, here's my Aurelia Weapons of War list that I've imported into MTG Goldfish. The online cost is about $200. The paper cost is almost $1,400. So that's going to be like a pretty typical ratio. Let's take a look at a few of the expensive things in paper. So like Sword of Fire Nice, $72. Uh, Sword of Feast and Famine, $60. Mana Crypt is always crazy. Uh, Ugin, Ugin is very expensive. When we look at Magic Online, let's take a look at those, some of those same cards. Ugin's about $4. Fire and Ice is less than 2 Feast and Famine is about 4 Mana Crypt is $8 right now. Mana Vault is $3. Like I said, Soul Ring, unusually expensive at $11 right now. Ooh, Ancient Tomb's gotten expensive too. A lot of the colorless staples have been spiking because a lot of people have been signing up and playing Commander Online, so the supply of these has dwindled. But Ancient Tomb used to hover around 4 or $5 typically, so I, I suspect that may come back down at some point. So yeah, I just wanted to illustrate some of the price differences between Magic Online and Paper. Yes, it still costs money, but in general, it's going to be way less expensive than building the same Paper deck. Uh, one of the things to keep in mind is there's no reserve list on Magic Online, so they can reprint dual lands all day long. You'll notice Plateau is a dollar. <laughs> And that's true for a lot of the dual lands. Some of the ones that are used in Legacy are a bit more expensive. Volcanic Island is usually one of the most expensive. But yeah, we see some other stuff. So let's just take a look. Dowsing Dagger, two cents. Mask of Memory, four cents. Swiftfoot Boots, six. Sword of the Animus, 70 cents. Tome of Legend, 70 cents. Umazawa's, 29 cents. Winter Orb, three dollars. Sunforger, two cents. I'll, you can buy so many cards at like 10 cents or less on Magic Online. So it really doesn't take a lot to build a pretty decent deck. A card like Survival of the Fittest, crazy expensive in paper, on the reserve list, $2 on Magic Online. And at one point it was even less than that, it was like $1.50. So if you really like old reserve list cards, building these decks on Magic Online is so much cheaper than building them in paper. But again, it's not free, it's just way less expensive. Before we move on from card acquisition, there's one more thing I want to talk about. Uh, there's a website called mtgowikiprice.com. And many of the bots on Magic Online are part of this network. And this service is useful for two things. One, it can help you find the best price on a card. So let's say I want to try to get the best deal on Badrock. We'll type in Badrock's name right here. We'll do the search. So this will bring up all the bots that are part of this network. There are many, not all of them, but many. And it'll show what price they're selling that card for. It'll also sell what price they're buying it for. So this can be a useful tool. This is a thing that I've used in the past, but as I talked about, you don't want to spread your fractions of dollars around in too many different places. I found that the three or four biggest bot chains are usually within like pennies of giving you the best price. I found that it's not really worth the time to sit here and try to get the absolute best deal on a card. Cause some of these, once you actually get to the bot, they may not have it in stock. I don't know exactly how often this page updates, but sometimes you'll get to the bot and they won't have the thing in stock that you were trying to get, or they aren't buying it, or they aren't buying it at the price that they listed on here. Uh, so I don't know exactly how often this updates, but in general, I found that Time is a resource, so for me, it just makes the most sense to use the big bot chains, keep all my fractions of a dollar in one place. But this is a thing that is here if you need it. So there's one more thing I want to show you right here, and if we go to the bottom here, we type in our username, and we click update our credit, and what this will do is this will show us bots where we already have credit with them. So it says I have 19 credits with 7 bots, that's actually quite a bit, I should probably like go look into that. Apparently I've got some credit with this bot right here, so I should probably go do something about that. Um, but yeah, this will show you where you have credits with these bots. Now this is showing also with the search that we did, so there was a way to get a listing of just all the bots that you have credit with, regardless of a card search, but uh, I don't know how to do that anymore, they've changed the website a little bit, but you guys can tinker around with this, so just so you know that this is here, if you really want to hunt and peck for best possible prices, you can do that, or if you're trying to find where you lost credit to some bots along the way, that's also a thing that you can do. 
So just to make sure you're aware of that service. So I think that wraps up everything on building a deck, getting cards, putting your deck together. So I hope that helps. But stay tuned for part two, where I talk about some things that you can do in-game to play faster, use hotkeys, and make life a little bit easier when actually playing a game of Commander. So anyway, hope you guys enjoy this video. As always, feel free to comment, like, or subscribe. Thank you for watching. I want to thank my awesome Patreon supporters. You guys are awesome. If you want to help support the channel and vote on which decks I play next, feel free to check out my Patreon at the link below. And be sure to use the TCG Affiliate Player link if you're buying Akoria and Commander 2020 cards, as it helps support the channel and it doesn't cost you anything. And finally, if you want to play paper webcam games of Commander with me, be sure to check out the Eventbrite link in the description below.